Good morning and welcome to this installment of the PBPA's monthly webcast series. My name is Sarisha Ganta. I'm an attorney and education director with Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. I'm excited to have with us today Michelle Johnson, a partner at Nelson Mullins, and Amy Chung, an associate at Nelson Mullins, here with us today to speak to us about volunteered and employees who also are minors. These are special considerations for your youngest workers. Before Amy and Michelle speak to you more specifically about this topic, I want to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the Pro Bono Partnership of Atlanta. Our mission is to provide free legal assistance to community-based nonprofits that serve low-income or disadvantaged individuals. The way we do this is by connecting those nonprofits with attorneys from Atlanta's leading law firms and corporations to assist them with their business law matters. If you're interested in learning more about being a client of PBPA, um, please check out our website. Um, but our clients are all 501c3 organizations that are located in or serve the Metro Atlanta area and are otherwise unable to afford legal services. Also available on our website um, for free for any organization are a ton of amazing resources including articles, podcasts, and webcasts. And hopefully um, in the next few months, we'll also be starting our in-person workshops. And if you have any questions for Michelle or Amy, you can type them in the chat box below. But just keep in mind that today's information is just general information. If you have specific questions about your organization, please do reach out to an attorney. And today's presentation is copyrighted. And now I'll turn over the mic and the camera to Amy and Michelle. Good morning, uh, this is Michelle Johnson. It's great to be here. Uh, and as Sarisha said, today's webinar covers legal considerations for nonprofits that employ minors. Most of the federal child labor laws are found in the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the first question from a federal law perspective is, does the FLSA apply? As the slide states, the FLSA can apply to an organization as a whole, which means it applies to everyone who works there, or it may apply to individual employees. The first type of FLSA coverage is enterprise coverage, which means that everyone who works there is covered. Nonprofits are not subject to the FLSA unless either they are a named enterprise or their gross revenue derived from a business purpose exceeds $500,000 per year. If either one applies, then everyone who is engaged in the enterprise is covered by the FLSA. The named enterprises where everyone who works there is covered include hospitals, providers of residential, medical, or nursing services, schools, and government agencies. Gross revenue includes funds that are received from activities performed for a business purpose. So that would be fees for service or um, revenue from sales, but it doesn't include contributions or grants. Uh, and only employees who work in the business enterprise are covered, not employees who perform only charitable activities. An example of enterprise coverage uh, provided by the Department of Labor is that a nonprofit animal shelter provides free veterinary care, adoption services, and shelter for homeless animals. And those are all charitable activities not performed uh, for, for fees. However, it also provides veterinary care for a fee to customers. So that is a commercial activity. If the revenue generated from the commercial activities is at least $500,000 in a calendar year, then everyone who is engaged in the commercial activity is protected by the FLSA. But employees 
of the organization's charitable activities would not be covered on an enterprise basis since those activities do not have a business purpose. However, the, the best rule to follow with respect to enterprise coverage for a nonprofit is to assume that you're covered. That, that's the, the, the safest thing to do is, is not to rely on the fact that you may not be an enterprise uh, when you're looking at child labor laws. Amy? Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, Sarisha, thank you so much for the opportunity to present with Michelle this morning. Uh, as Sarisha mentioned, I'm an attorney here at Nelson Mullins, and I work very closely with Michelle uh, Johnson, the senior partner here at our firm. And so just to pick up and further elaborate with you all, um, you know, Michelle has discussed, you know, whether or not the FLSA applies to you as an entity. And What's also interesting is that even if the entire organization is not subject to FLSA, the individual employees could still be protected. And so it's just good for you all to be aware of that um, and as a potential you know, flag. Um, and typically individual employees will be protected if they regularly engage in interstate commerce or in the production of goods for interstate commerce. So let's break that down a little bit. What does that actually mean, right? So an employee that regularly engages in interstate commerce is, for example, um, defined by as an employee who works, whose work is directly or vitally related to interstate commerce. So, for example, a salesperson um, could be considered uh, an employee who regularly engages in interstate commerce because they have to travel a lot for their work. Uh, maybe a bus driver that drives across state lines. Um, those have been examples that have been given in the past as guidance. Um, employees who are in the production of goods for interstate commerce, what does that mean? Uh, that could be anything from an office to clerical employee um, that prepares and sends letters all across the states, right? Because they are in the production of goods that are interstate commerce, i.e. between states. Um, and so, you know, here we've given some examples of interstate phone calls, shipping materials to other state, just kind of, you know, always using your best judgment, common sense um, when applying some examples. And of course, if you all have any specific questions, like Sarisha mentioned, you can always reach out to Michelle and I after this call. But I think if there's anything to walk away with, with respect to FLSA, you know, Michelle, and I just want you all to know, one, always abide by the law. Um, you're here, so that means you you at least want to do that and um, and try your best efforts. Make sure you know you talk to labor employment attorneys like us, um, so that you're you know you're in uh, compliance with federal and Georgia state law, and you know assume, like Michelle said, that unless you're otherwise told, just assume that a FLSA applies to you, right? Always apply the most restrictive law, um, be conservative, and, and, and you know that's how you can make sure that you're doing the best that you can for, for your organization and for your employees. Uh, before we move on to the next sort of subtopic, um, we wanted to see if there were any questions with respect to FLSA, uh, enterprise, or individual coverage. Um, I had um, one quick question, and um, I guess this goes to how come we're starting with talking about FLSA? Is that because that's what sets the parameters for age of employees? Well, that's that's where the child labor laws are. Exactly. And so the federal the federal laws are there in the FLSA. So that's that that's why we're starting there. Okay. Thank you for that background. Um, no further questions. Awesome. So uh, with that said, um, not seeing any additional questions in the chat, we will move on um, to the to the heart of this presentation. And, uh, and Michelle will kick it off by discussing some age and hour limitations for you all to consider. So here, here are some very specific rules with respect to how old uh, minors have to be to, to perform certain activities and what activities they can perform and, and, and under uh, what requirements with respect to hours in a day and hours in a week. So in general, uh, children in Georgia who are 12 or over may work and under federal law 14 or older. There are 
some limited exceptions for children who are younger than 14. For example, child actors, uh, child singers, uh, babysitting, non-hazardous work in a family business, and even gathering evergreens and making evergreen wreaths. For some reason, Congress thought that it was important to permit children to make wreaths. Uh, specifically, with respect to minors who are 15 and under, there are rules with respect to how many hours a day and how many hours a week they can work. Uh, the federal rules are the most restrictive, so those are the ones that you should follow. Three hours a day on a school day, including a Friday. Eight hours on a day that's not a school day. 18 hours during a week when school is in session. 40 hours when school is not in session. And then with respect to time of day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. during the school year, from June 1 to Labor Day, it's extended to 9 o'clock p.m., not during normal school hours. And that applies, those are public school hours, and that is the rule for everyone, whether or not you go to public school, private school, or are homeschooled. There are some exceptions with respect to agricultural workers and entertainers. Now, when a minor becomes 16, the limitations with respect to hours in the day and hours in the week go away. There's no mandatory cutoff if you're 16, no maximum number of hours per day or week. The limit is uh, employee willingness. Amy? And we had a hypothetical. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Michelle. We had a hypothetical just trying to engage, um, you know, some participation because we understand, you know, this is virtual and um, and rather than you having just sitting here for the next however many minutes listening to Michelle and I talk at you, we thought, you know, through the chat, we can get some um, some type of interaction going. Um, but before I get to the hypothetical, I see that Tonya from Small Up had a question for us, Michelle. She said, and um, she has a great question. She said, when we are referring to work, are we only referring to paid work and are volunteers excluded from the this part? And this goes to, um, you know, th this goes to best practices. The Fair Labor Standards Act, child labor laws only apply to work for pay. So this is not a, this is not applicable to volunteers. However, um, in the real world, I think the best practice is for a, a nonprofit to follow the same rules that the FLSA applies with respect to child labor. So you don't want kids working, um, you know, nights and weekends, or you know, or, or, or volunteering for for too you know too long. But on the other hand, the the laws are don't apply to volunteer work specifically. And, and so the, you know, I would use the FLSA and the Georgia law as, as a guide. Yeah, and I would, I would, Antonia, I would uh, echo Michelle's sentiments uh, as well here. Um, you know, uh, we will get to, uh, in the subsequent portions of our presentation, also discussing activity limitations. And I think to echo Michelle, again, these are technically FLSA guidance, so for paid work, but you also want to consider using that, right, for vo your volunteers. And um, and so just have that in the, in the back of your mind. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for that. So the hypothetical is this. We, you have hired a 16 and a 17 year old to work the morning shift at your organization's annual back to school festival. So the event occurs on the first Saturday after school begins. Um, so this is a weekend. So the day before the festival, all of your all of your employees are forced to quarantine due to an illness. Can you require the two teen employees to work both the morning and evening shifts? Um, do we have any? attendees who would like to type in the chat and give us their uh, thoughts and um, of, of, you know, whether or not you can require them. And, and if it would be helpful, I will 
I will um, go back a slide because <laughs> uh, I understand that, you know, uh, it may be helpful to, to have um, the prior slide up. <clears throat> And if we have no volunteers, that's fine as well. Um, I'm, but I would like to just give people a minute or two to to see if they would like to say or type a response rather. And I do see people typing, so I appreciate y'all for your willingness to participate. <laughs> So, so Tonya said, uh, you cannot require them to work, but you can ask them if they want to. I see that Ellen is typing, but maybe no longer typing. Oh, nope. Ellen and Chaz are typing. It was the same. Great. Okay. And then we'll give Chaz an, another minute. Oh, I imagine the same thing. Excellent. Okay. So, yes, um, y'all are all correct. There is no limitation for 16 and older. Um, we've included some what we call bonus facts here. Um, as you may imagine, 16 and 17 year olds, they are learning to drive or have just gotten, you know, their various permits. So it's a very exciting time. And so the, a consideration for that would be um, you would want to make sure that it is not, I'll call it the wee hours of the morning, um, because they're under, you know, class D driver's license, they're not permitted to drive um, in the evening or early mornings. And so the hypothetical we gave it one of the shifts right was from 3 p.m to 1 a.m so that's just a consideration and um and then additionally you know technically um you're not you don't have to provide them a meal or rest break uh however to michelle's earlier point about best practices uh you may consider uh giving uh your employees uh your minor employees you know a break um just to just to give them a chance to kind of you know kind of take a minute take a breather that sort of thing um <clears throat> so going on next um for Oh, I'm sorry. Chaz had a question for us, uh, Michelle. I would want a teenager. Oh, no, do not apologize at all. This is meant to be interactive, engaging, and for you all. So um, to the extent that Michelle and I can help, we're happy to do so. Uh, Michelle, Chaz wrote in the text, uh, in the message, I would want a teenager working that long late, but is it best practices for the employer to consider the bonus fact number one? which is that I, if they you know, have a, a, a provisional driver's license and they can't drive, yeah. they can work, but somebody's going to have to pick them up. Right. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, Chaz, maybe the parent can come, um, you know, maybe an, an, an older sibling uh, who doesn't have that provisional driver's license could come. So, um, you know, there are, you know, workarounds for that. Uh but is that something I need to clarify during onboarding or orientation? I would say it's best practice to always, you know, flag for your minor employees uh, that on the front end uh, so that he or she is aware because uh, they may not be. Um, but as an employer, um, you know, you can absolutely tell them that. And I think it's good okay. to clarify with, with. I think it's good to clarify with your minor employees also if they have limitations on their driver's license or, or transportation issues. You know, to know that going forward, so that you're not asking them or putting them in a position where they might be violating the law. Excellent point, Michelle. 
Chaz, I hope that answers your questions for now. And again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to uh, type them in the chat box. Perfect. So uh, one thing that Michelle and I did want to flag for you all is with respect to minors, they do, uh, under at least in Georgia, require employment certificates. So, and two, um, I think someone asked an earlier question about volunteering. Vo as a volunteer, you do not need an employment certificate, right? Because it's a volunteer position. It's not a paid position. Um, but for any of your minor employees, uh, they would need to obtain a, the Georgia Employment Certificate before they are hired, okay? And so this also applies to any minors from out of state who might be here um, in Georgia working maybe for the summer or something to that effect. Um, they can uh, you know, usually they can obtain it through their school uh, or if they're homeschooled through the, you know, the person or persons um, who are providing that home study program. With respect to what are your responsibilities and as an employer, um, generally you'll want to describe um, in a statement what the minor's jobs and duties will entail. Um, and then, you will also need to return the employment certificate um, after the minor has terminated um, his or her employment with you. And then during the employment, you should keep a copy of the certificate on the premise of where he or she will be working. Um, and so that's just, you know, um, just so you can pull out a copy um, if anyone ever has any questions. And, you know, I think this goes without saying, but just want to clarify that employment certificates are essentially a work permit. Um, and so you just want, and so that's why it's just important to have that on hand. Uh, we're going to be moving on to a different topic. Uh, activity limitations. So before we get there, wanted to see if any of our attendees had any questions with respect to the hypothetical, um, the employment certificate, or anything Michelle and I have said so far. Uh, Latoya, she, uh, Michelle, she wrote to us, uh, oh, Scott said no questions so far. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Latoya said, I apologize. I was late. No need to apologize. Uh, do you know of places hiring at 15? I don't, um, I, 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 th I you know, I wonder if, if anyone in the audience, uh, is hiring 15 year olds, uh, at their nonprofit. You know, I'm, I'm not aware of any. You know, when I was 15, I babysat. Uh, that was, right. you know, bas basically getting did yard work. But uh, Amy, what's been your experience? Yeah, I, I would say I'm sort of the uh, same to Michelle. I, I think I, um, I think I did chores around the house or for family friends, and and that's how I worked. Uh, I know Tonya just said Publix and Chick Fil A hire 15 year olds, uh, and. and 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 that and that you know may make sense. Um, maybe they're you know for Publix, maybe they help with walking um, you know their clients to and from the grocery stores. I know that's huge. Customer service is huge for Publix and and as well for Chick Fil A. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that information, Tonya. Um, and then I see that we may have one other question, Michelle. Um, Luella is typing. Oh, oh, and Luella just uh, said to Latoya, we have utilized them as teen mentors. So, excellent. Thank you so much uh, to the PBPA community for helping us with that. Excellent. Okay. So, so not seeing any on. other questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yep. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, no, <laughs> no, on. not at all, Michelle. I was just going to transition oh. to. <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, okay, so moving on to activity limitations. And I think here is where if I'm using volunteers, I would follow the same rules as the, the pay, the, the employers for pay follow because the, these are actually, they make sense and, and, and I think they're important. Um, so minors who are under 18, 
uh, cannot provide hazardous occupations or tasks. Uh, and they're the same requirements under state and federal law. Uh, if you're 15 and younger, everything's hazardous unless it is specifically listed as approved. And if you're 16 or 17, it's the opposite. Everything is okay unless something is specifically identified in one of the hazardous categories. And, and some of these are pretty scary, so it, a lot of this is common sense. So if you're 15, you can run errands or deliver things by foot, bicycle, or public transportation, can't drive. Uh, you can perform intellectual or creative tasks such as computer programming, teaching, tutoring, singing, acting, or playing an instrument. And when, when my son was 15, there was nothing he would have liked better than computer programming and getting paid for it. 15-year-olds uh, can be lifeguards. And 15 and under can work in the kitchen and food service on a limited basis. So they can reheat food, they can serve food, they can wash dishes, they can clean things. They can prepare food, but only on a limited basis with an electric or a gas grill that doesn't use an open flame, not an oven, or a deep fryer, but only one that utilizes an automatic device to raise or lower the basket. So you may have seen this at McDonald's when you're, you're ordering your fries. They have one of these where you push a button and the fries go in the, the oil, but you are not physically lifting the basket and putting it in the oil. Uh, 15 and under can load and unload things. They can perform office tasks or clerical tasks. They can type. They can answer the phone. They can pump gas. They can hand clean cars. And then uh, retail, for instance, at Publix. They can be a cashier. They can bag. They can sell. They can mark prices. They can pack and shelf. They can clean things. They can wash the vegetables, wash the fruit. Uh, they can weigh, price, and stock items but they cannot work in the freezer. And they uh, cannot uh, work in the, in the public's deli if it or the bakery if it requires them you know, using the oven or cooking things that are beyond the limitations. The other thing they can do is yard work. They can weed, uh, they can rake, but what they cannot do is mow lawns. So, Anything that's not specifically li listed if you're, eight, if you're 15 is permitted, not permitted. So again, no baking, no construction work, no manufacturing, uh, no operating power-driven equipment, including a lawnmower or an edger, no sign waving. So again, anything you can think of that's not on the specifically permitted list is not permitted. However, if uh, you're 17 or... Oh, go ahead. So this you, Amy? My bad. Yeah, but no, no, go, go for it, Michelle. You're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. So just to, just to continue, um, uh, if you're 17 or younger, you cannot drive. If you're, if you're younger than 17, if you're 16, you cannot drive for any reason. If you're 17, you can drive with numerous limitations, no golf carts, only a car, or small truck, no motorcycles, no ATVs. You must have completed the driver education course. You have to drive during the day. You have to wear your seatbelt, and, and the company has to remind you to do that. Less than a third of the workday, uh, less than 20% of your work hours in one week. No more than three passengers. Uh, you know, clean driving record, no sales route. Uh, no pizza deliveries, you know, nothing that's time sensitive. Uh, you can't tow anybody. And, and, and driving is, it's only if this is occasional and incident to your employment. So this is, this is not being employed as a driver. So Amy, you got some other thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think this is good. I was going to move on to the next slide. Um, but before I do, uh, Michelle, Tonya had a great question. She said, we have volunteers who hold signs at our events to advertise the event. Is this not permitted? You know, I think, Michelle, I have some follow-up questions to Tonya's question, which is, where are the volunteers holding the signs? Are they holding it on a street corner? Is it in a parking lot? 
uh, Tonya, if you can um, provide us some additional information with respect to that. And I think one point of clarification as well, Tonya, remember this is FLSA. So if this is a, if your question is about a volunteer, we're talking best practices. Um, so just wanted to make sure for that. Um, so she said street corner with adult parking lots. <clears throat> I think that's okay um, because uh, number one, yeah, it's I, volunteer, not FLSA, and number two, um, it, it seems to be fairly safe because they're doing it with an adult. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think that sounds, I think that sounds right. Yeah, I agree. Okay, she said perfect. Uh. Oh, Ellen just asked, so they would definitely need an adult. Best would they practice. definitely need an adult to hold? Yeah, I think I it's say, best, I practice. Would say best practice. And really, Ellen, the issue that I'm thinking of is 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 safety and and uh, me too. And you know, a, you know, and something that is comfortable for for the kid. And and so, in terms of you know what's legally required, you know, I don't. I don't think we can say that it's required that a volunteer child have an adult with them when they're holding up a sign. Uh, but I would just kind of think about, you know, in the context of who your volunteers are and giving them the best possible experience. I agree. And, and I think um, before I move on to the next slide, it may be helpful uh, for you all, you know, the framework in which Michelle and I give best practices or a general labor employment advice is for kids, um, the statistics given by the National Institute of Occupational Safety, right, states that there's about 160,000 American children who suffer from injuries every year. And so when Michelle has gone through you know, considerations for your employee and then best practices for volunteers, remember that she said the focus is on safety. And so that's where we're coming from when we give you um, our advice is having that number in the back of our minds. Um, and so I think if you knew that number, hopefully that can help you frame, you know, your tasks for your minor employees and or um, volunteers. Um, not seeing any other questions. I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Michelle, does that work for you? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Awesome. And so kind of piggybacking off of Michelle's advice about driving, um, there's also, you know, power driven apparatus equipment. Um, not sure how applicable that is to the audience today here, but since this is a general, you know, high overview presentation on just minors, um, advice for minor employees and volunteers in general. We wanted to at least flag these things for you all because, uh, you know, fact is always uh, more interesting than fiction. You can't, you just can't make up the fact patterns. And Michelle and, and I have seen so many different fact patterns come through the years. That, so, so that's why we wanted to just kind of at least flag this for you all. You know, Again, with the safety framework in mind, right? Um, your minor employee, 17 or younger, cannot assist with bobcats, you know, cherry pickers, cranes, forklifts. These are what we would consider heavy machinery. And so, if there was any type of injury that would have occurred for a minor, it can be catastrophic. And so, you know, maybe not here in Georgia, but, you know, ski resort, chair lifts, you know, gas station, mechanical car lifts, again, kind of heavy machinery. Um, you know, to Michelle's point about the oven, right? So bakery equipment, mixers, um, saws, deli meat slicers, you know, really, I think this list sort of speaks for itself. And again, you all are extremely smart and capable members of our community. And so, you know, just thinking from the safety perspective of a young child, you know, we don't want them to be operating such heavy machinery um, at such a young age. And so um, that here's just a, a list of things um, for you all to consider. <clears throat> And then, of course, moving on next, you know, roofing, um, no type of roofing work, um, you know, nothing in prox 
in close proximity to the roof, gutters, you know, downspouts, um, nothing like that. You know, it, there's just too many risks involved, right? If they were on the roof and then something happened, God forbid, they fell, um, they're working close to a house and then, I don't know, the gutter got loose and then it fell. You just want to, again, be thinking from the perspective of the safety of the um, of your young employee and volunteers. And so that's why um, we put this, this up as a consideration. <clears throat> okay, so we love hypotheticals. We love putting y'all through the ringer. <laughs> um, y'all have done wonderful so far. So we've got another hypothetical for you all. So here you're hiring a 15 year old, a 16 year old and a 17 year old as summer maintenance workers for your property. Um, sort of already have the answers here, but can they drive visitors around a golf cart? Um, you know, no, um, because it goes to Michelle's earlier point about driving, right? Um, can they drive to Home Depot in a car to buy supplies? 15, 16 year olds, no, but 17, yes, with the provision, depending on what their license says. Um, mow the lawn, 15 year olds, no, but 16, 17 year olds, yes. Um, and then patch leaks in the roof. No, right. We just talked about that. So, um, you know, that's kind of where, you know, we're going um, with, again, the, thinking about it from a from a safety perspective. Um, we have another hypothetical. Um, Michelle, did you want to take this one? Sure, sure. So you have a 14 year old who works in the dishwasher in the kitchen. And sometimes the chef asks him to take pies out of the oven. Uh, is that permitted by child labor laws? And again, we've got the answer here, no. Uh, taking things out of the oven is baking, just like putting things in. And minors under the age of 16 cannot put things in the oven. They can't take things out. Um, do any of you have have uh, uh, minor employees who, who work in, in food service or uh, work in uh, lawn service? I, I just kind of want to get an idea from our audience. What kinds of things do you have kids working on? Anyone? I think uh, several people are typing this show. Excellent. Okay, shelving at the library, perfect. And assisting with serving food, fine. We've, we've talked about that. Great. And again, teaching, we've talked about that. So it sounds like everybody's, everybody's on, the, on the good list. Okay. And Scott, Michelle said, my main interest is on volunteers and any limits by age. Uh, so okay. Scott, we are getting to that uh, next. And I know and then, one of the questions. Uh, I, was just, I, was, I was looking. Is it okay if we bring baked goods from home? Perfect. That's fine. Um, girls work as camp counselors and mentors. Fine. Fine. Uh, yeah. Assisting facilitators, uh, working computers and social media. Fine. Uh, cleanups and litter pickups. Fine. So great. That, those, and, and those are some great things for kids to do. And shopping with parents. Good. Good. That's great to purchase items yep. for the food pan. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Okay. Excellent. So, volunteers. One question, intern or volunteer? Uh, now, a lot of interns are paid, and, and there's nothing wrong with having a paid volunteer. Those jobs are, I mean, a paid intern. Those jobs are governed by the rules we just talked about. Now, the unpaid interns is, is a different story, uh, but similar to a volunteer, main difference is why you do it. Volunteers are performing a public service. Interns are trying to learn uh, so they can advance their careers. Uh, and, and the question whether an intern should be paid or not focuses on who is the primary beneficiary of the relationship. Is it the company 
For instance, if you have an intern who's making copies and answering the phone, uh, probably they should be paid. But an intern who is shadowing someone else um, may well be the primary beneficiary of that relationship. Volunteers don't displace employees or perform work that would otherwise be performed by regular employees. So over the summer, if, you, if you've lost an entry-level person and you hire a teenager to take their place, you can call them an intern, but you really do need to pay them. So the primary beneficiary test, this is set forth in the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. It's okay not to pay your interns because they're not considered employees if they meet these factors. Uh, first of all, everyone understands that the intern is not entitled to compensation. They, you know, they go into it understanding that they're not going to get paid. Um, even better, if the internship is similar to training that is given in an educational environment or the intern gets high school credit or college credit, then when they get credit, it's, it's an easier decision whether they should be paid and the answer is they don't have to be. Um, if the internship accommodates the intern's academic commitments and corresponds with the academic calendar, that's looking more like a, a, a primary beneficiary being the intern. If the experience is for the intern's learning and development, um, and, and a lot of times having an intern isn't exactly an asset to the business. I mean, you really do it, you know, in order to help kids. Whoops, in order to help kids learn, um, and that's that is a, a sign of of an internship relationship uh, where the intern is the primary beneficiary and need not get paid. Um, again, the intern should not displace or supplant a regular paid employee or perform duties that the regular employees provide. And most, very, or not most, but very important is that the intern understands that they're not entitled to a job. They're not working in order to get a job at the end of the internship. You know, just basically working for free for a while first. Amy? Yep. And just some additional volunteer considerations for you all to think about um, is, you know, they should not assist with the company or the <clears throat> nonprofit's commercial activities, right, such as like, you know, a gift shop or something that um, helps bring in um, or generate potentially profits um, for, you know, the organization. Um, if the volunteer is also an employee, they should not be volunteering to provide the same type of services for which they are paid. So, for example, if I am working as an accountant um, for my firm, I should not then volunteer as an accountant um, for my firm, right? So it, it, you would want to just encourage them to try something else. Um, if your organization requires <clears throat> uh, volunteers to execute a waiver consent form, um, contracts by unemancipated minors are voidable and um, uncertain if patient, if parents sign waiver effective to li limit liability to the minor. And, um, and then again, kind of piggybacking what I said earlier, minor volunteers do not need the worker permits. Um, so these are just some things to, to think about. I see that we have some questions in the chat. Um, okay, hold on one second. Uh, Heather Michelle asked, what about teens helping our friends of the library groups used bookstores and sales? Let me ask you this question, Heather. Um, do they, uh, do, does your organization bring in $500,000 a year uh, from, from these sales? If not, then Fair Labor Standards Act wouldn't apply and we, and we don't have to think about um, whether the, the no. volunteers, uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, so you're, she's, you're set. Yeah. Okay. And then we have some other, I just want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Um, uh, Tonya, we have young volunteers help with our community sales events. So we may want to ask Michelle Tonya the same question. 
uh, okay, so Tonya said that's perfect, Michelle. Thank you so much. Uh, right. And then Darlene, right. what about volunteers help process merchandise in the back of our thrift shop? And again, uh, how much how much does the thrift shop earn? I think Darlene might be. So let's let's assume. Okay, number one, if if the thrift shop generates around. Okay, so you're covered. <laughs> so so the thrift shop is is covered by a. Um, it's covered by Fair Labor Standards Act. So the question is whether uh, volunteers can process merchandise in the back of the thrift shop. Is that something that the volunteers do as opposed to paid employees? And if so, then okay. So if you have volunteers only doing doing that work, you're fine. And great, Perfect. great. And then I know, Scott, you have mentioned that you were very keen on this topic. So I just wanted to make sure, um, sorry for calling you out, just want to make sure you didn't have any additional questions for us. I know, Michelle, one question that came up was, what age can children vol volunteer without parental consent? And there's not a so, law in Georgia that requires parental consent to be a volunteer. I think it's a best practice. And, and so yeah. uh, that uh, so, so to answer your question, you know, there's no legal requirement. But again, I I you know I like to see my nonprofits get the you know get the parental consent to be sure that the, the parent understands what the kid yes, is doing, doing and agrees and is invested in it. it. I agree. I, agree. I, agree. I also have a question. question of, how many total hours per event or day are children allowed to volunteer? Again, uh, since they're volunteering, they're not covered by Fair Labor Standards Act, but the best practice would be to follow the same law that uh, governs the, you know, the, the work that the, the kids do when they get paid. And with respect to one other question we had, types of activities that youth volunteers are not allowed to partake in, uh, again, the Fair Labor Standards Act officially applies to paid work, but I would follow the I would follow that same uh, path with respect to volunteers. That you don't want them doing something that is so dangerous that that, that it's illegal for them to be paid to do it. And Heather, I think we have another question here. Um, let's see. Well, I think uh, well, I think we may have a few. Uh, Darlene, so we do. We also have students fourteen to eighteen, to 18 help in our thrift shop. shop. Is this okay? We, we also, also have student volunteers to help in our thrift, thrift shop. shop. Student um, volunteers. Yeah. I would say um, okay. Obviously, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. It's fine. Um, fourteen, fifteen. Under, under federal law, I would I would use you know I follow the same guidelines uh, with respect to hours of work. Um, you know it's not dangerous activity there. You know the, these are some of the listed activities for uh, fifteen year olds. Um, but I guess one question is: um, Do these student volunteers displace people who who would make money uh, working in the thrift shop? And if so, then that may be a problem because uh, the, the question, question is whether the volunteers really ought to get paid. And, and, and so, so, let's see, there's another, another one. one. Um, there's no the minimum, minimum age for volunteers, volunteers, example, six years, years old. Technically speaking, Scott, um, the, you know, vol the FLSA covers paid work, and, and there's not a, a legal requirement that you be a certain age to be a volunteer. Right. But and I would just add, Scott, you know, just again reminding you and everyone else on the uh, webcast today, you know, just make sure that it is appropriately, the task is appropriate for the age, right? So um, 
I, 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 personally I personally can't, can't right, right now envision a work for a six year old, um, maybe then like counting pennies and dimes or something for you, but you wouldn't want, you know, a six year old doing something that is maybe more appropriately tailored for a 14, 15, 16 year old. So just wanted to flag that for you. And um, Scott's, Scott's business is, uh, is sharing a hospital, sharing art with hospitals. And, and so they do, uh, ah, they, they, they do pain. pain, you know, they do, and, 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 I, I, and I know Scott, Scott so, so I don't mean to call you out, wow. but that's to give a little context. Um, they, they do some Got of those okay. team building activities where everybody paints, and then they share the paintings with hospitals. And, and so some of that art you oh, see at, so at, at some of the facilities is, is from, from Scott's organization. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Amy, you want to I'm trying to keep up. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, okay, so Heather said, thank you so much, Amy and Michelle. This has been a huge help. Um, you're so welcome, Heather. That's kind of what we're here to be and do for you all. Um, Darlene said, we allow 16 plus year olds of age to volunteer without a parent, without a parent with a parent signed waiver. We allow 13 to 15 year olds to volunteer in our thrift shop with a parent. Is this policy okay? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Michelle, let me know what you think, but I think generally that sounds fine, right? Again, Darlene, kind of what we've been echoing throughout this presentation, you know, you just want to make sure that it fits into those general buckets of activities that are, you know, with safety in mind for the 16-year-olds. Um, and if, you know, if it's a sign, like we discussed somewhat at length earlier, you know, best practice would probably to have an adult, right, supervised. Um, 13, 13 to 15 years to volunteer in our thrift shop, shop with a parent, uh, that's fine. I think caveated with Michelle's comment about, you know, making sure the hours are um, fit under the FLSA, even if they are just volunteers, right, for best practices. Um, Tonya, can you please elaborate on the previous slide regarding waivers? Waivers. Uh, which one? Okay. Um, so, so if your organization, organization requires volunteers to execute a waiver or consent that. form, um, I think this, you know, no, I think this just, and Michelle, let me know what you think, but I, you know, this just says like, it's, if a parent, like a parent for a minor can waive certain liabilities um, for his or her child. Um, and, um, and then generally you just can't enter into contracts with minors. Um, and the thought behind that is essentially that you don't, you're not in the same level of bargaining power, right? You have a minor with an adult, um, they don't fully maybe comprehend the contract terms and the significance of it. So that's what that means by voidable. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is that if, so, if a parent signs a waiver um, to limit liability, liability to a child, child um, that, that is probably not enforceable. Um, one uh, way to get around that is to have the parent agree to, to, to uh, hold the company harmless from claims from the child. So, for example, um, if a child is injured, then the parent can waive can, can waive things like um, payment of, of medical expenses that the parent is responsible for. But uh, if the child dies, then the, you know, the parent cannot waive the, you know, the, the damages for the injury that the child has. But what the parent can do is agree to hold the company harmless so that if the company is liable, then the parent agrees to indemnify them. So it's a little complicated. Yeah. Um, um, and then Darlene um, and Michelle had a question. Entity service volunteers uh, for court ordered requirements. Um, what is the youngest age you recommend? That may be covered actually by the contract with the the court. So I would first take a look at the at the court's contract, and and then um, if there's if it's if it's uh, if there's no uh, restrictions with respect to the, 
the court's requirements. I, I think I would start maybe 16. I think I think that's a good age. If, if what they're doing is receiving and sorting merchandise, my concern is if you get somebody who's a juvenile offender who's much younger than that, you know, I don't know that they, they have the, you know, the responsibility to really make it worthwhile to you, <coughs> excuse me, to use them. Uh, and we, so have, we do you have five minutes left, and so we're going to try to get through the remaining questions as much as possible. Um, okay. I think so Heather number one, we have volunteers. Next, yeah, volunteers shelving books, but we have paid staff doing the same things when there's not volunteers. Would these shared duties mean the volunteers should be paid? You know, um, this is, it's not ideal to have paid staff doing the same work as volunteers, but if, if it's required, I mean, if you, you just have so much volume, I, you know, I've not seen a case where a volunteer came back and, and, and filed a lawsuit and asked to be paid. And so I think one thing that's important is to have your written policies make sure that they've signed the volunteer agreement, that they, they know they're not getting paid. And, and I think that may help you there. But again, better to have uh, volunteers doing something different from what the paid staff do. Okay, Amy, you want to you want to zip through these last couple? Yeah, uh, Darlene said if a parent signs an electronic waiver online, is their electronic signature enough, or should it require a written signature? No, I mean to me, it, it, you know, a signature is a signature is a signature, um, and a lot of people, you know, we all do things electronically now. So again, Darlene, just make sure you keep a copy of the electronic signature. I would say in paper file because. You know, this is not part of today's presentation by any means, but technology, while we are so reliant on it, it tends to have problems, right? And so if you were to lose everything, God forbid, on your laptop, desktop, you want to make sure you have a paper file somewhere for your for your own record. So that would be my only recommendation, Darlene. Um, Tonya had a maybe a, a question of... Are there any rules on communicating with minors outside of parental supervision? For instance, having an, an, an app that volunteers use to sign up for uh, events. <clears throat> um, no, I, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's, you know, anything nefarious with with that app pers um, you know, in, in, that fits this specific fact pattern. I think, you know, again, best practices, right, is on the front end when you're talking to the minor and his or her parents, just let them know that that's, you know, the organization's preferred method of communication and see if they have any questions or concerns. Um, you know, and, and I just think, you know, I, I think Michelle and I's general bucket of advice to the extent we can have one is, you know, constant communications is always good and helpful. Um, it clarifies questions for the parent it makes them feel better. You are all more likely to be on the same page with respect to things like that. Um, so, you know, Tonya, you you seem like a very smart, capable person. I, I have no doubt that, you know, you'll be able to communicate that effectively. Um, um, Heather wrote hundreds of thousands of books a month. Oh, okay. That, that may have been, a, that may have been, thank you for the clarification. And then Tonya, thank you so much. I think that's all the questions that we have answered uh, with a minute to spare. So Srisha, we will hand the mic back to you. Um, well, thank you both so much, Amy and Michelle, for sharing um, your insight and your expertise um, with us, not only today, but um, in general, all the amazing volunteer work that you do for PBPA and our clients. Um, we really appreciate you. And uh, to our nonprofits who have joined us today, um, thank you for joining us. And also thanks for all the great work that you do in the community. Um, I hope that this information was helpful. And if you have any further questions, you can reach out um, to PBPA. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, y'all.